Mill. I'm on Turnback Creek in Lawrence County, Missouri. Hi, I'm Jim V. Brock and I have spent the last 30 years out documenting old mills just like this one. Let's take a look around. Grist mills were powered by water. So let's talk about how you get the water to the mill. There's a creek over my shoulder this way and a ditch here. This is called a race and separating them is a gate. If you open this gate, this race will fill up with water. And because it's rock lined, I bet this is really pretty when it's full of water. This water is the power that runs the mill. And there are three primary ways of powering those mills. This mill, when it was original in, 19, in 1840 rather, was two-story and I think it sat in a slightly different position than this structure does today. There is a foundation over here that has a separate race to it. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in this case, this race would be powering that wheel as an undershot wheel. So let's go talk about the different ways a water wheel would have been used to power the mill. Mm -hmm. talk about the different ways mills are powered. The way this one is set up would be called an undershot wheel. This is one of a few examples of mills I've been to that actually is kind of set up that way. It's not my favorite way because I think it's very inefficient use of the water. This is a relatively deep race. It's about two feet deep, probably totally full of water. And if the water was coming through here, it would have to come through here at a pretty good click in order to turn this wheel with any horsepower at all. A lot of the water is going to go around the sides of the wheel and going to go under the wheel and that's just lost power. So a better way of doing this is probably the most popularly photographed way mills are operated and that's with an overshot wheel. That's where a chase will come across the top or a sluice. A sluice will come across the top. It's a trough full of water and it'll come across the top. It'll go just to the, uh, just past the top dead center on the wheel. The water will cascade out of that into little pockets into the wheel itself. The weight then of the water caught in those pockets turns the wheel through gravity. That is a much more efficient way of using the water and you can use a lot less water. One of the mills I toured recently claimed that their wheel would turn with just a cup full of water in one of the troughs. So you can see it's much more efficient use of the water. And in a case like this, when you had limited water, probably would have been a better way to operate this mill. The third way that mills are operated is the way I think this mill actually was operated originally when it was a two-story mill. And I'm gonna show you in just a minute. There is another race on this property that is very deep and actually has a shaft and I believe that's where the original turbine sat. So there is a turbine on this property. Let's go look at it and talk about how it might have worked. All right, let's talk about how a turbine might have been used in this mill. Behind me is a foundation and this looks like the place that the turbine was probably attached in the original mill. And it looks like a pretty good setup and it probably would have worked. The way these work is through static water pressure. You have water in a shaft above this and as the water comes down through it, you can open these fins and there is a propeller inside, an impeller in there that will turn as these fins are open. The wider you can make these fins with the more weight that's above the the turbine, the weight of the water creates horsepower as it goes through there. It turns a vertical shaft and then the vertical shaft goes into the mill and through a pulley system you would then operate the equipment. This is by far the most efficient use of the water and these came around in the late 1800s and were used very widely through the 1900s in these mills. Now the interesting thing about a, a turbine is that modern technology and modern hydroelectric 
dams today, they're using a turbine that looks very similar to this to generate electricity all across the United States. So 1800s technology is probably powering your home right now. This is probably going to be very loud. This is where I think the original turbine and shaft probably sat in this mill around 1840. The shaft is still here and the turbine we just talked about. This container, this shaft here, when full and full of water, is about 14, 15 feet. This would have been a very efficient use of power for this mill. Let's talk about the millstone itself. Inside this mill is a more modern Meadows stone grinding mill where the wheels are vertically. One is stationary, the other one turns against the other. I have a uh, grinder similar to that in my personal collection. But you'll find millstones sitting around old mills all the time and they're really kind of cool. They're made out of the hardest material that was in the area. This one I think is limestone. They made them out of marble, they made them out of granite, they made them out of just about any really hard stone that they could find. These grooves in here are what moves the kernels around. As the kernels are in there and the, the stones are turning against each other, this allows them to roll and grind as they, as they go through the, the grinder. These are really cool. They're really heavy and changing them out was a little dangerous, particularly on the big mills uh, where the, the wheel could be you know, 38, 40 inches across. This one here is about 30 inches, so it's not a super big uh, grinding stone, but it's really cool that it's still here on the property. Now this mill is situated on Turnback Creek. This is a beautiful little creek and in the summertime when this is all leafed out, this is an absolutely beautiful place to come hang out. Turnback Creek is a little bit cool, but it's warm enough to swim in and this is a great swimming hole because it's not very deep and the water is fresh, crystal clear and wonderful. I swam in Turnback Creek many times growing up. And it's just a tribute to why you will see so many mills in beautiful locations all across the country. They're in these nice valleys, they got water features coming right up to them, and they're just a joy to come explore. Let's talk about the process of turning corn into cornmeal and wheat into flour. So what would happen is the local farmer would grow their crop for the year, in this case corn, they would allow that corn to dry out. So it would be way late into the season. The kernels on the cob have gotten hard and they've already taken the silks off and they've shucked the corn and so they've, they've got the ear of corn. They would bring that to the miller. And a miller is called a millwright, by the way. So the millwright would then take it and run it through some form of a corn sheller. A lot of these smaller mills would have a hand cranked corn sheller. I have several of them in my collection. Or they'd have a belt driven one where you'd put the, the corn in the sheller and it removes those hard kernels off of the cob. They would then take the kernels and put them into the mill, the actual grinding mill. In the case of this mill, they have a small meadow stone grinding mill and the stones are vertical and one will turn and the other one doesn't. The kernels fall down in between the stones and depending on the setting you have with that mill, the different coarseness of the grains that come out. So you could set it to do grits, you could set it to do cornmeal, or you could grind it all the way down to a flour-like consistency so that you could make uh, breads or whatever else out of it that you might want to use for it. The same process as far as the mill goes or the grinder goes works for the wheat kernels as well. And you would pulverize it down to the consistency of what you see as flour today. By the way, it's not going to be perfectly white. It's going to be an off-white, almost a brown, because they haven't bleached it like they do in modern technology. So that's the basic way a small mill like this would operate. The way the millwright made money was that they oftentimes would share in the crop. So the farmer would bring the crop in, the millwright would uh, mill the product down to whatever they wanted, 
and the farmer would give the miller some of the product in exchange for doing the work. Sometimes they paid them outright, sometimes they paid them in the form of cotton. They would then bag those uh, products and sell them to the other people of the community that weren't farmers. It was a great process um, and it was a great way of having everybody in the process make a little bit of money. Now it's not uncommon for entire communities to pop up around these mills. This is no exception. There's a little garage here and over my shoulder there was a house and a little mercantile over there that has since burned since the last time I was here. So it was not uncommon for these, these little communities to pop up and it makes perfect sense because as the farmers came to town they didn't do that very often. They came every once in a while and while they came they'd get their hair cut, they would get groceries from a little mercantile store and supplies, things like that. So it's not uncommon as I go around and look at these mills I see these really cool little towns that have sprung up around it and then have since fallen by the wayside. Let's talk about something that really is a big deal. I'm in South Central United States. I'm in Southwestern Missouri, and a lot of the meals in this part of the country were burned during the Civil War. That's right, they were burned. The reason for that is they were the economic centers and they were the food source for the Confederate soldiers. So in this part of the country, many of these mills that weren't very well hidden were burned to disrupt the economy and the food chain for the Confederate soldiers during the Civil War. So to find a mill that survives that and is still in pretty good shape today, it really is a big deal. building here was erected and was used as a cabinet shop uh, for a period of time and and then it was moved to the Britton family which it has been for quite some time so it's got a lot of history this building was restored back in 1976 and it's been kind of a little tourist spot ever since now I have to point out that I'm on private property and before I came today I called and got permission to come here the family is very nice but be respectful of private property if you decide to come here I'll try and include the contact information in the description I hope you enjoyed our tour of Britton Mill in Lawrence County Missouri on Turnback Creek I'm Jim Vibrock let's go find another mill to explore mm -hmm.